Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. The text that engages us this morning is the gospel reading from Matthew chapters 9 and 10. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. Now, when my family moved here seven months ago, there were a few things that you warned me about uh, to prepare me for living in a new climate. You mentioned that it would take time to adjust to living at a higher altitude, that breathing would be more difficult, that we needed to take our time when we uh, went about our day. We needed to drink lots of water. You warned us about the greater sun exposure and about not talking badly about the Broncos and Rockies. But you didn't mention anything about how difficult it would be to grow grass in the yard. (laughs) Ever since moving into our house, we've had this six-foot crescent-shaped scar in the front yard. And a few weeks ago, I finally took it upon myself to try and fix this blemish, or at least attempt. I went to a nearby hardware store and asked one of the employees for some suggestions. He recommended I pick up one of the simple all-in-one solutions that had everything you needed in it, but I I didn't want to bother with all of the fancy stuff. How how hard could it be? I just wanted to plant some seed with some topsoil. Well, I cleared an area with a rake, spread the soil, and planted the, the basic seed that I got. I've been watering out there twice a day since Memorial Day, and the spot is still there. If you get out a magnifying glass and take a close look, you can see a few blades of grass. But between the rain stopping, the birds eating, and the dry air soaking up the water I attempted to put on the ground, my grass harvest hasn't been very good. Well, Jesus brings up a much different problem to his disciples in our text this morning. Jesus says, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You know, Matthew doesn't share the reactions of the disciples, uh, which is interesting, being that he was one of them. He was there. Maybe Jesus doesn't give them time to react before he moves on with his plan in the second half of our reading. But if you've been reading Matthew's gospel up to this point, if you've been following the story, you might understand that the disciples are taken aback by the fact that Jesus mentions this dilemma. I mean, most of the disciples have been watching Jesus since chapter 4. They listened to his sermon on the mount. They watched him cleanse a leper, heal countless sick people. They saw him cast out demons and calm a storm in which they thought they were going to die. They saw him tell a man who was paralyzed to, to get up and walk. They saw him stop a woman's bleeding and raise a little girl from the dead. He healed two blind men and a guy who couldn't speak. I mean, these disciples have seen all of it. This Jesus that they had been following was Lord over all things and nothing could stop him. And and yet here is Jesus bringing up a problem that has given him pause. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I mean, typically agricultural problems do not contain the words plentiful, and harvest. I mean, drought, famine, fire, plagues of locusts, yeah, those sound like problems, but, but a plentiful harvest. And how is this not one of those situations that Jesus just says the word and the problem is solved? Again, we don't know what the disciples are thinking at this moment, but Matthew is very clear about what Jesus is thinking and what Jesus is seeing. By this time in his ministry, Jesus had gone through all of the cities and villages in the region, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God and healing every disease and affliction. But when he saw the crowds of people, wherever he went, 
Matthew says he had compassion on them. He had his heart, his heart ached for them. His gut wrenched for them as he saw what his beloved sheep had to endure. They were harassed. They were helpless. They were sheep without a shepherd. They were in desperate need of knowing that the kingdom of God was now near. They needed to know that even in the darkest days of their harassment and their helplessness, that their Lord reigns. And this is exactly how Jesus looks at our world today. He sees the injustice. He sees the persecution. He sees beyond the veneer of people who think the world is far better off because of our advancements in science, technology, medicine. He sees people who settle for far less than what God has intended for them. Jesus looks at his people today and his heart aches. His gut wrenches. And Jesus sees it all. And he graciously invites his disciples to be part of the harvest work. I mean, notice what Jesus says in response to the problem he brings up. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Pray earnestly. You know, in the Greek, that's just one word. Which essentially means beg. Beg the Lord of the harvest. Now, I, I love this image of prayer because it stretches us in ways we don't like to be stretched. Jesus is calling his disciples to recognize their complete helplessness in fixing this problem on their own and to go to the only one who is capable of bringing laborers to his har harvest. You know, there's a great humility in this kind of prayer. Jesus is basically saying, hey, you know those people who are standing at all of the intersections in your town holding up signs with their lives scribbled on cardboard? You know the ones that you scoff at? The ones that you can't look at in the eye? I want you to be like them. I want you to be fully invested in the fact that you have nothing of your own, that everything you need must be given to you. To beg is to be fully engaged in the situation that is before us. To beg it is for us to be able to see the world as Jesus sees it. Now, this is Jesus' first command to pray since teaching his disciples how to pray in the first place. When he, when he teaches them the Lord's Prayer there on the Sermon on the Mount back in chapter 6. I mean, this moment is where the rubber hits the road. This situation is exactly what it means to pray the words, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This situation is exactly where we are called to ask that it may be given, to seek that we may find, to knock, that the door may be opened unto us. The Lord over all things, who casts out demons and calms a raging sea with one single word, it could have resolved this harvest problem in any number of ways. And yet he invites beggars to pray, to call upon great power in a position of weakness. Matthew then continues the story at the beginning of chapter 10 in verse 1. He says, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. Upon being invited to pray for laborers to be sent for the harvest, the disciples discover that they themselves are the laborers for which they've been praying. The Lord of the harvest sends them. He gives them authority to cast out demons, to heal every disease and affliction. Jesus gives this band of rascals, these 12 beggars, 
authority and invites them to participate in the very things that he was doing as he was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God. He invites them. He sees what's at hand and he turns to the disciples. And the same Lord of the harvest, as he looks at the world today, he invites you. He looks at the world around us and says, I know exactly who to send. He is not shaken by the mess. He is not shaken by the brokenness around us. No, he reigns. And his way of, of dealing with this, of approaching this, of being able to go and approach this harvest is by sending you. You who bear the seal of Him who died on the cross. You who have been given the riches of heaven, the forgiveness of sins. You who have been given new life in Christ. Who by faith live in the hope of the resurrection. He sends you. Now you are not sent with the same instructions as the twelve disciples in these verses, but you are sent with the same message. The kingdom of God is near in Jesus Christ. God has broken into this mess of the world to change its course, to redeem it, to restore it. Our work may not seem as significant as the disciples, but the power and authority is just the same. I mean, every time we baptize, forgive sins, receive the Lord's Supper, share the love of Christ with our neighbors, every time we do these things, the kingdom of God breaks into our reality. And it gives people a glimpse of hope. It shows them that there, there is more to this life than what is around them. It speaks a message of hope to them that they are desperate to hear. That God has been preparing for them to hear all the while. Remember, as God sends us, He sends us as laborers to go in and reap the harvest. Not to cause the growing, not to try and make it happen, but to go and to see the work that He has already done. To see the fruit of His power, His might, His love for this world. He sends us that the people, the people around us may know this Jesus who does not wait for perfection to show his love and to share his love with people, but who shares his love in this way. That while we were still sinners, he was willing to die for us. That he was willing to lay his life down for even you and me. That when he looks at us again, he did not wait to show his love, but poured it out. He looked at us. He looked at this world and had compassion. That is the mercy. That is the love that we get to share. And so thanks be to God that Jesus has sent us, that he has equipped us, that he has given us the opportunity to participate, to go and share his love to go and be laborers in his harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise.